Okay, hi everybody. Uh, today in this video I'm going to go over the solutions to the exam questions that we had uh, on last Wednesday, the beginning of February, our first exam for ITCS 3145. Uh, today I'm going to go through the answers, uh, the solutions, and hopefully address what the answer is, uh, why we need to actually know this or why is this information important and also how can you learn more or how can you can you go back to the material we've already seen and, and study this idea uh, i'm going to try to remember to hit this for all of them if i miss one please feel free to uh, bring it up later and i will try to address it so first let's switch over to our uh, questions so the blank runs before the compiler to handle uh, include and define statements. Of course, this is uh, before the compiler in C. Uh, our compiler is generally GCC. Uh, and so, let's see, GCC uh, is the GNU C compiler as we've talked about in class. Uh, and there are several stages to this compiler. Uh, we've, we've gone over this a couple times, but basically the first stage uh, is the preprocessor, which is also the answer to your question. Uh, the second stage would be compilation. Uh, linking and then assembling. Uh, now we've gotten through this hierarchy before. It's not necessarily super critical that you, you have an in-depth understanding of every single one of these items. Uh, but it is important to start to kind of learn how these things work and how they interact. So the preprocessor, as we've uh, discussed in class, will run through your code before the compiler runs and handle all of these uh, include statements. It will handle anything basically that starts with a pound include, um, a pound define, these kinds of things are handled by your preprocessor. And you may recall that we've done an example in class. Uh, if we switch back over here to the Canvas page, uh, we do have a preprocessor demo. Now this, this code itself does not do uh, anything in particular. To take advantage of this, you would want to load up main.c here and compile with gcc-e and see what you get. So if we were to do that just here on my terminal, uh, we could do GCC dash big E, which says just run the preprocessor, do not run anything else. Uh, and what you'll see here is that the preprocessor runs through. Uh, and for include statements, it will copy and paste the content of your .h files into your C file. Uh, so you'll see it transforms this foo.h into uh, the actual content of the foo.h file. Uh, the second thing it will do is for defined statements, it will do textual replacement. So you'll see we have the, the, the definition bar here. It looks like a variable, it is not a variable. Your preprocessor is going to run through after it sees this pound define, look for every instance of the word bar in all caps, uh, and replace it with the value that we defined bar to have. Uh, so it is important to know how the preprocessor works. You can play with it if you want to understand what it does using GCC-E. Uh, that could maybe help you understand if you're not sure. Uh, we do want to be able to talk about these things. The why here uh, is very much that, that the preprocessor is a, is a something you're going to use no matter what, uh, whenever you're C programming. It's good to be able to reason and understand about what 
uh, the preprocessor actually does. And it's also important generally to be able to talk to other people about uh, what your code does or what they should do with their code. Uh, even outside of school, uh, whatever ha language you happen to code in, you'd like to know the details of your language so that you can have a meaningful discussion about it with your coworkers. It's very difficult if we never learn the proper terms and we're productive on our own and we can use our IDE and it does the right thing, but then when we need to explain to somebody else, we don't we don't know how to talk about it in a way that they understand. Uh, it can be very uh, non-productive. So let's move on to uh, example two, or to question two. Note that these examples, all the examples we've done in class uh, are here on Canvas in some form or another. They're intended for you to play with them in some way or to study. Uh, yeah, so let's move on to question two. So every header file needs blank to ensure that the program still compiles correctly if it, if it is included by multiple .c files. So we have talked about this a few times. Because your preprocessor copies and pastes uh, things into uh, the files that include them, uh, if you were to include a function multiple times, if you were to include the, the, uh, a header file multiple times in multiple C files, what you end up with is multiple definitions of the same function, um, which is gonna cause a compiler error. Uh, and you've probably seen this in one way or another in, in some language. Uh, multiply, defining the same function multiple times will typically lead you to some sort of compiler warning, compiler error, uh, or even interpreter error in Python. It may get confused. Um, so, the answer to this one, every header file needs include guards. So let's take a look here. So we'll look at the question real quick first. Every header file needs blank to ensure that the program still compiles correctly. Well, if we hop over to our headers uh, example and we open this smartarray.h, You'll see we have our include guards that we discussed in class. Uh, include guards always look like, uh, if not defined some definition, uh, then define the definition and include your code and then end if. So again, these, this preprocessor runs before the compiler and determines what code actually goes into the compiler in the case that we have if and def statements uh, here. You actually, you know, if the way this works is that if this is already defined, then the compiler will not see the code below it. So um, this is intended to allow header files to only be included once to avoid this multiple inclusion problem. What we call the multiple inclusion problem uh, but it leads you to multiple definitions of the same functions, which are going to cause compiler errors. So we really want to avoid multiple includes by always using include guards when we write our header files. Uh, and of course, you can read more about this. Uh, or you can play with this example. If you combine this example with your dash E flag, it, it might help you understand if you're having some confusion about how these things work. Uh, I will take just a moment to point out the uh, page on Canvas. If we go to home, uh, this resources for Centara C programming and other tools. Uh, again, I try to bring this up about once a week. This is here for you. Uh, and I try to update it regularly with things that might help you. Most recently, it seems that there was a lot of confusion about command line arguments, so I added a, util or a, a demonstration of command line arguments. Uh, we've talked about debugging tools, and we'll come back to these later. But we, we somewhat regularly update this page with things that will help you. Uh, some of these C resources will talk about header files and the preprocessor. 
Uh, we can also jump over here really quickly to just see our, uh, you know, one of any, any number of examples of the steps of C programming so that you can, this is something that is Googleable. This is something that you can do some research into if you want to see more. Uh, but you'll see any one of these figures basically comes to the same conclusion. We don't want to watch a YouTube video right now, but source code, preprocessor, compiler, assembler, linker. Preprocessor runs before the compiler. Okay, so let's move on to the next question. So we'll write a line of code demonstrating the declaration and heap allocation of a 10 element array of type float in C. So we will jump back over here real quick. And in fact, I will just move to this side of the board. So a few things. So first off, you, you can consider them in separate parts. So write a line of code demonstrating the declaration of a 10 element array of type float in C. Uh, the declaration itself uh, does not need all of this information, but the allocation does. So let's go ahead and flip over to our whiteboard. So the declaration of a 10 element array of type float, uh, and we know it's going to go on the heap, can just be float star x. That is a declaration. Uh, now, I did ask you to write, so that is the first part of this, is the declaration. Uh, the second part is the heap allocation of a 10 element array. So there's a few pieces to unpack here. Uh, first, we did ask for one line, so we'll just erase the semicolon, and we'll just wipe away this GCC real quick. And so heap allocation means malloc. Uh, it basically just does. There are, other, there are a few other ways to get heap memory, but generally we've talked about this as malloc. Uh, the second part is it needs to have 10 elements. So we can do 10. Uh, this just, if we just stopped here at 10, this requests 10 bytes. Malloc doesn't know what the size of the thing you want is. So we have to tell it 10 times the size of uh, a float. We've talked about size of a few times. It just tells you how large a type is. It's not really a function. It's just a tool that your compiler allows you to use to figure out what the size is uh, inside of your code so you can do things like memory allocation. So the full answer is float star x equals malloc 10 times size of float. I would have accepted this. This may or may not give you a compiler warning depending on what uh, compiler you're using or even I guess some compilers are pretty restrictive. It could give you a compiler error. Um, you might have to cast this. I didn't count that on the exam, uh, but you may have to cast this to be a float pointer. Malloc always returns a void pointer uh, because again, it doesn't know what type of thing you're requesting. You're just requesting a bunch of bytes. You know what you're going to do with it. You handle the typing. Malloc just gives you a chunk of memory. Uh, so it is important to understand malloc. Uh, I'm actually going to do another video after this one that explains a little bit better uh, malloc versus heap, or sorry, versus stack allocations, uh, because there seems to be some confusion about that, and I want to clear that up. But not everyone will get this far in this video, so I will make a separate video, uh, hoping that people will watch that at least. Uh, okay, so let's go to the next section, or the next question. Uh, write a printf statement to print the value of the ith element of array d. For example, if i equals 2 and di equals 15, then your printf statement should print d2 equals 15. So this is a, uh, I guess, non-trivial example of a printf statement. Uh, 
it does ask you for something pretty specific, but the key to printf is that it basically always works the same way, uh, no matter what format you want. So you start with printf. Generally, you want to start with a string as the first argument. It's what we call a format string, which is what printf stands for, print formatted. Uh, so we want to do printf, uh, and we want to give it the shape of our string. So we want our output to look like this if, um, you know, if i equals 2 and our array d i equals 15. So uh, we know a few things. So first, we want it to look exactly like this. So the things that are fixed, we can just put as characters. So the letter D is fixed. This bracket is fixed. Then we want the letter I, but we don't want the actual letter I. We want the value of I. This is when we use a format specifier Uh, for an integer. You've seen me do this several times. I think all of our examples include one of these. Percent %d will let you substitute an integer, which is what we're assuming i is based on the context of the problem. So you do percent %d uh, will print an integer in this spot. Uh, then we want to do an actual equal sign, and then the question is what does what is in d i? And so we do another percent %d. Again, we're assuming it's integers because the type here is integers, uh, or at least the example shows an integer. Uh, so percent %d would be true if it's an integer. Uh, if it was a long, you would use percent %l. If it was an unsigned integer, you would use percent %u. Uh, I would have taken any of these that fit the context of the problem because I did not give you the types, but I did give you an example, any matching type. Uh, would be fine. Uh, basically anything but percent %s and percent %p and these things that are just for different types will do it. Uh, I did generally give credit if you didn't quite do it this way. I usually gave you most of the credit as long as it wasn't. Um, there are a few answers that are many lines and the purpose here is to show you you can do the purpose of printf, the purpose of format specifiers is to let you do complex things like this in a single print statement. Uh, so that's it. Uh, just as an FYI, you should basically always give a new line at the end of a printf. The reason is that uh, printf buffers strings. Um, hopefully you know what that means, but if you don't, it's fine. Uh, it just means that your, in this case, it means it's going to save up these strings and until it sees a new line, and then it will print them to the screen. If your program crashes, if you get a seg fault, before the next new line, your print statement may not actually print. So you generally want to have new lines just to make sure that your printf actually prints. Uh, there are rare cases you don't use it, but at least in this class, you generally would want to be using new lines on every single one. Uh, now, we do need to make some space here So percent %d, percent %d, for each format specifier, you need to give the matching argument. So we give comma i, comma d, i. And this will print whatever we asked for. This will print what we asked for. Uh, you have to have a matching argument for each percent, percent whatever, each format specifier. Okay, uh, let's switch back over to our questions and go to the next question. Write the function prototype for main, including the argument counter and argument vector. Uh, so you should have seen this by now in your assignment. Uh, we've also talked about uh, the format specifiers quite a bit. Or sorry, not the format specifiers, but the function prototypes. We've talked about how we need to define these in, um, in our header files so we can do that. 
So uh, a function prototype, again, is just the header of the function. So int main, uh, this is worth about a third of your points if you got this far. Then you need a type and a name. So the next type would be int argc. This is how many arguments we have, argument counter. And then there are a few formats that you'll see this appear in. Uh, I think this is the canonically correct one. Char star argv brackets, so an array of characters. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, this will actually work also, and it basically means the same thing. Uh, it, the, the bracket gives you a better indication of where the memory is stored, because this is stored on the stack. Your strings are stored on the stack. Uh, but I would have given you credit for basically anything that told me uh, you need both pieces here. You need the double pointer, or you need, it, it is, there are two pointers involved. So anything that would have shown that, even if it was syntactically correct, I saw, or incorrect, I saw a few things that were maybe like this. Uh, it's not right, but I would have given it to you because it's not that big of a deal. Um, and then the last portion of this is, do you know that a prototype ends here? The function prototype ends here. Uh, if you add brackets, you're no longer a prototype, you're a function, you are the, this is the implementation of a function. So uh, they're two different things. And I wanted to be clear about that. Okay, let's move on to the next question. So next up, uh, answer one of the following pairs. Valgrind helps us detect uh, the correct answers here are memory leaks and memory errors. Um, I took a few things that got in that general direction, but not everything. Um, if you put bugs and errors, then you maybe got some kind of credit, but those are really the same thing uh, in this context. Um, but it is true. Uh, GDB allows us to blank through our code line by line. Uh, I probably gave you some kind of credit if you wrote debug, but the correct answer is step. Why is it step? Step is the command you enter into G GDB to do this. I also would have taken the letter S uh, because it, that's, it means step. GDB understands S to mean step. Uh, we can also set blank to stop our code at a specific line number or function. Uh, that would be breakpoints or breaks or B, Bs. Um, anything like that I would have also taken. And if you got close but didn't quite get the terminology right, you probably got some kind of credit. Um, it's important to know at least one of these. It's actually important to know both, but it's much better to know both of these because uh, they will help you find your bugs. Uh, I know I've talked to many students who have said, I have a seg fault, I don't know what to do. And the answer is these two tools will help you uh, and they are not that hard to learn how to use if you have kept up with the other material in the class. Uh, so you'll notice here on our resources for Centaurus page, I've actually posted some tutorials for Valgrind. Uh, this tutorial is not long. I can't even scroll down. Uh, you can click, keep clicking through this if you want. You can click, keep moving through and find the new pages and learn what each thing means. Uh, it is a far more thorough explanation than I can give you. Uh, individually. So I recommend you take a look at this. Uh, and here is Valgrind's webpage itself showing examples of how to uh, interpret this. These will help you if you need to learn how to use these. Uh, and you do because you should Valgrind your program basically every time you make a change. If you're ready to test your program again, you should Valgrind it. If Valgrind comes back with memory errors like this, uh, then you have a bug. Even though your program seems to run correctly, you have a bug. 
uh, and it may not show up every time you run it, but it may show up later. Um, and that's kind of the danger, that's the biggest danger of having so much control of memory is that sometimes you can do things you didn't intend to do. Uh, likewise, there are several GDB resources here. Uh, one from another university that has some slides that walk you through ways to use GDB, all of the details, what is it for. Also some uh, walkthrough from Red Hat on how to use GDB uh, and a few different ways to use GDB. And there's also a YouTube video here that seemed useful uh, for this topic if you would like to hear somebody say these things out loud. GDB, again, GNU debugger, it is to help you debug. Uh, it is when you're, this is the first thing you should turn to, uh, maybe it is the first thing you should turn to, period, but uh, if your basic printf statements are making things weird, then GDB or Valgrind is a good, are good tools to turn to. Okay, uh, so let's move to number eight and then we'll take a quick break. So number eight, how is a string represented in C? Hint, there are two details. Uh, a string is represented, the answer I was really looking for here is something that indicated um, array of characters. Uh, I think generally if you put char star or char bracket, I mostly gave you credit, although what I was really looking for, again, is array of characters, because this is asking you how it's represented. Uh, but there's a second part here, which is why these are not quite correct. Um, the, the array of characters is more correct. Uh, the second part here is that a string is a little special. A string is a little different than just an array of characters. A string, a C string, always ends in a null terminating character. Uh, this null terminator is how we're able to print strings without knowing how long they are. It lets us do um, all of our, it makes all of our string operators work. And you've used this in your project, but you may not have noticed that you've used it. Uh, it's also possible in your project you ran into bugs because of this null terminator. So um, that's something that you may want to consider even when you have things like this printf here. Uh, these string declarations, these um, constant string declarations still actually have a null terminator. You just can't see it and you don't have to type it explicitly, but you still get one. Uh, whenever you do this kind of declaration. Okay, so very quickly, we'll just look at this example of a C string. This representation is pretty good. I don't always like these Geeks for Geeks articles, but this is a pretty good one because it shows this example. And this is exactly how C strings work. Uh, you have characters in your string. There's a hidden slash zero here. Uh, and strings are just arrays of characters. So the address of this guy, if we start at 23452, well, then the next one is at 23453, and then 454, 455, 56, 57. Uh, so this is how it's laid out, and you just always want to have this slash zero. If you're building a string without using a string utility, then you have to make sure this zero is here. Uh, likewise, you may have noticed in your project that if you used the string tokenizer function, uh, strtok, uh, it will modify your string to add these zeros after every word, uh, which can make it a little tricky uh, because then you have partial, you kind of have partial strings. You've allocated more data, but as a string, you end at the newest null terminator. Uh, so you may have encountered that. I did talk to a few of you about how to resolve that. Uh, but anyway, C strings are a, um, a relatively common topic. It's not hard to find further information about this topic. So next, 
Let's keep on moving through this. So number nine, name two ways to modify Fotostar X so it is no longer a dangling pointer. Uh, so let's just make some space here real quick. Uh, we'll just take a pause for a second while I clean this. Okay, so how do we illustrate our, or how do we modify our float star X so it's no longer a dangling pointer? Uh, we've discussed in class on a few different occasions that there are only a few valid ways to initialize a pointer. So we'll take our float star X. Uh, we, to make it not a dangling pointer, we either need to make sure that if this is used inappropriately, your program will crash, or appropriately allocate memory. So the kind of answers I was looking for are float x equals null. Uh, this is a really easy way to make sure that your program will crash. You'll get a null the equivalent of a null pointer exception. It will be a seg fault, but it will be because you dereferenced address zero and Valgrind will be very happy to tell you it's because you accessed zero and you'll know exactly where this bug happened. Uh, another possibility is you write float star x equals malloc, blah, blah, blah. This will allocate some memory. X is no longer a dangling pointer. Another possibility is you give x the address of another existing variable if this is what you want to do. This will make sure it's not dangling. Uh, of course, you'd like this to actually be, you want to actually be using this correctly. Uh, it's not good to do this just because you don't want a dangling pointer. Uh, you better have a good reason to modify y as x. Um, otherwise, it would be better to just assign null. If you don't know what you're going to use it for, just assign null. Um, if you know you're going to use y, then, then make it y. Uh, I did see, I, I got some answers that are kind of right. Uh, for example, I had some flow x bracket 10, uh, and that will allocate some memory and it will subvert the dangling pointer, even though X is still a pointer because arrays are pointers in C. Uh, it's not exactly what I was looking for, but I did give you credit for this because it does count. The reason it's not what I'm looking for is the same reason we ta I talked about arrays a few moments ago. Uh, again, I'll make another video uh, so I can complain about these arrays. Uh, but I did take this on the exam because it does fix the problem and it does show me you understand the problem here is a memory issue. Okay, so let's look at our next question. Next question regarding structs. When should you use the dot operator versus the arrow operator? Uh, so what that means is if we have a struct foo uh, a, then uh, for A, we are allowed to access A's member uh, fields like, like this. So you can say a.bar, a.num, elements, whatever, you know, it just depends on what fields A actually has, you can do that. Uh, when you want to use the arrow operator is when you have a star here. The star here will do you so will uh, make this a pointer. Of course, we'd rather this not be a dangling pointer, so we'll allocate some memory for it. Uh, then accessing A is a two-step process. Accessing the struct stored in A is a two-step process. Uh, first, you have to dereference the pointer. Then you access the members. Uh, the arrow operator will do this for you. It will do both. It will do what you want to do. It is much easier. The alternative would be that you have to write star a in parentheses dot bar. These two things, this arrow and this star a dot bar, are the same thing. 
you should use the arrow instead. It's a lot more readable, a lot more maintainable, a lot easier to understand what you're doing. Okay, so the next question. In C, we explicitly use pointers to enable two functions to modify the same memory. Uh, this is because, unlike Java, C arguments are always passed by. Uh, the correct answer for this is by value. Everything in C is passed by value. Uh, in Java, some things are passed by value, some things are passed by reference. So we can look at an example. Uh, if I write int foo, int, in fact, let's make it vo void. Well, yeah, we can leave it as int. It's fine. We'll leave it as int, int foo, int x. So when you call foo from main, You will give it, uh, you know, something. So maybe we have a variable y, so we'll give it y. The value in y is going to be copied to x. If we change x, y is not changed. This is because we passed by value. When you pass by value, you make copies. You make a copy of y into x. You're passing the value of x. You are not passing x itself. You are not passing a reference to x. This is true in Java and in C. Uh, when you pass into x, you're making a copy. This is passed by value. In Java, if you were to make a proper object, Uh, or it could be a string. Maybe a string is an easier example. Uh, maybe you're more familiar with strings. When you pass a string in Java, when you call foo, or you call bar, and you pass foo, foo can modify, uh, or sorry, bar can modify the string foo. Now, I guess strings are immutable in Java, so maybe that makes this example less valuable, but it could be as simple as you have a, a car object. If bar changes the car, if bar says, uh, you know, car y, it says y dot, uh, you know, there's lots of things you could do to y, but you know, you could set y set some value to y maybe if you have this function. That will change y. You will also see that change to foo because these are the same thing. This is a pass by reference. You are not passing the value of foo. You are passing a reference to foo. Uh, so in Java, objects are passed by reference. Primitive types are passed by value. In C, everything is passed by value. That is why we have pointers. If you have int foo and you pass a pointer instead, you call foo, you give it the address of y. Doesn't matter, this is an integer. Everything in C is passed by value. So everything is passed by value if we want to pass a reference, we have to do it explicitly. You copy the address of y into the variable x. This is still a copy. This is still passed by value. But we did give the function foo a reference to y. We had to do it explicitly. The language did not do it for us. It is passed by value. Uh, to give maybe the memory layout explanation, because we 
want to keep this in mind, in Java, all of your objects live down here. So if you create a car Y, it lives down here. It was created down here because you said the word new car. When you said new car, you said give me a heap allocation. Whether you're in main or you're in the function bar up here, um, y here points to this guy, who here also points to this guy. Likewise, in uh, C, you can use the same drawing, the same memory layout drawing, to indicate that y points down here. Uh, well, in this case, y probably lives here. And x here points to whatever y points to. It points to what y points to. So it can be a little dangerous to just put it here, but probably we assume y equals 4. And then, yes, it's safe to say this points here. Um, if you malloc, if, if y was malloc to be like to be like Java, and we just pass y, then y points to some data down here, and x points also to the same data down here. Uh, so all that is to say, you copy values in C. Values are copied. Uh, that is why it is passed by value. If you automatically, magically received a reference, like you do in Java, then it would be passed by reference. Uh, one last thing about this, just to really hammer it home, you could have a struct. And your struct could have an array of 100,000 elements as one of its members. Uh, if you call a function foo, if you say, let me just clear some space here, although we do want to remember to try and talk about all of these things. Uh, if this is what we have, and we call, uh, we, we declare a foo, we declare this guy, and then we pass a by value to a function. It is going to copy all 100,000 elements into the function. It is going to make a copy in bar of this entire 100,000 element struct. If you pass it by reference, the only thing you make a copy of is the memory address. The memory address is four bytes or eight bytes. Uh, the struct is 400,000. So it makes a big memory difference why you do this. So it's largely why we do this is to make it, um, to make memory usage more efficient, but also uh, to enable us to allow other, fun to use functions appropriately and these kinds of things. Okay, so let's move on. So, uh, number 12, int foo, uh, int star foo, int star j equals bar. This is a function pointer. Um, you know, we did have a quiz recently where I asked you what this is. Uh, it is in fact a function pointer. It doesn't matter particularly what name is in here. This is the correct way to declare a function pointer. So if we want to take a look at the, if we want to take a look at how this is structured on our whiteboard, we have int star foo. int star j 
equals bar. So this, this format is the correct way to declare and initialize a function pointer. Uh, and you can do this basically anywhere. You can do this inside of a struct. You can do this inside of a function. Uh, it is a variable. A function pointer is a pointer like any other pointer. It just happens to point to a function instead of an integer or something like this. Uh, so int star foo, what this says is um, basically the key way to, find, to figure out that this is a function pointer is to look at this. This parentheses star name syntax means it's a function pointer. Uh, this is the name of the variable, the function pointer variable is foo. It's similar to saying int foo. But again, this isn't an integer, this is a function pointer. Uh, its name just happens to be foo. Uh, you could name it something more useful. You might remember in QSort, you had to give a function pointer. Function pointer's name was compare. Uh, if it's descriptive, it's better. So this is foo. Uh, and then before it, pr what precedes it is its return type. These are its arguments. And so these can be just like any other function. Uh, that you would want to point to, you just have to have the two main components of the function. So this is a function pointer, so that's it for part A. Uh, part B asks you, describe all the information the statement tells us about bar. Well, what does it tell us about bar? Well, we're assigning bar to this function pointer. That means bar is a function, most likely. I guess it could be another function pointer. Nobody wrote that, but I would have accepted it. Uh, because a function itself is actually just a function pointer anyway. Uh, so that means somewhere there is a bar who has return type int and accepts some, it doesn't even matter what the name of the j is, it doesn't, it, it's not actually important, it accepts some integer pointer as an argument. So that is the key here. Uh, it, this is a function pointer. It's being initialized by bar. For this to work, for this statement to compile, bar has to be a function that matches this description. It has to return int. It has to receive parameters int star. Uh, that's the key. And that should have been what you've done on your assignment to do QSort is pass it a function that knows how to compare that fits the description of the comparator function. So if we want to take a peek at that real quick. Uh, QSort takes a function pointer. You see the parentheses star compare indicating this is a function pointer that returns int and expects two const void star values. So if we scroll down just to take a peek at this example, a legal pass to QSort is a function. We pass the comp string p function. That function is defined here. We'll find that this function returns int and accepts two const void pointers as arguments, just as the function pointer asked us to do up here. So we, um, that's really all there is to say about that. Function pointers have a lot of uses. They're a little bit advanced, but we've also spent a good amount of time talking about why they're used. Um, you will see this later this semester. This is the way that complex data structures are implemented in C. Uh, I may not ask you to write one, but you may have to read it. Uh, of course, I could ask you the right one. By this point, we should be um, we should be able to do that. So anyway, moving on. Uh, number thirteen: complete the following function that initializes every element to of x to zero. So what is this really asking you to do? Uh, well. 
int star is an array. Arrays are pointers. Uh, you can tell this is a pointer to an array by really just by the way it's defined, although I didn't give you explicit documentation. The definition here uh, is the de facto way to handle arrays in C. Of course, you could use a struct uh, also, but, but we didn't this time. So if we want to set everything to zero here, then there's two steps. Uh, the first step is um, we know there's multiple elements in an array, so we need a loop. We know our loop needs to go to size, uh, and of course fill out the rest of the floor statement. Uh, and then our variable is x, so we can use the bracket syntax to initialize x to 0 at every element i. Uh, now, it seems this is still confusing to some people. How am I able to use this bracket syntax when x is a pointer, arrays are pointers. You can always use the bracket syntax with x. You should use the bracket syntax when you can. It is much simpler. Uh, some people gave me more direct answers. Some people said star x equals zero x plus plus. Okay, this is correct. And this is using pointer arithmetic. And you did the arithmetic correct if you did it like this. It, this works fine. Uh, I don't recommend you do it this way, though. Uh, the array syntax is simpler and easier to read and tells you more about what this does. Uh, it also is less lines of code. It's easier to maintain. Uh, there are reasons to do raw pointer arithmetic, but mostly you just want to understand this is how this works. This bracket syntax is doing exactly the same thing, but the compiler does it for you, and the compiler um, doesn't often make mistakes like that. So it, it's just easier to do it this way. Uh, it's good to understand these are the same thing. So uh, number 14, complete the function get tail that returns the last element of the linked list pointed to by head. You can assume head is not null, which just means you don't have to do the error checking. Uh, so get tail is straightforward. So here is an interesting question. Uh, I really think this question uh, is somewhat indicative of how well you're going to do in this class if you continue where you're at right now. Uh, if you got this question, I think you're generally in good shape. Of course, that you need to have gotten a good amount of points on the rest of the exam uh, because all of these things are important. But this question... Uh, tells me if you have a decent idea of how structs work and a decent idea of how pointers work. Uh, and the fun fact here is that, well, uh, we'll come back to the fun fact. Let's look at the solution first. So if I want to do get tail, uh, we'll just copy the syntax here. So we'll do struct star, uh, or sorry, struct node star, get tail for a struct node star h. I'm just going to write h because uh, it's shorter. It's easier for me to write this much. So how do we finish this function? Well, we just want to get the tail element. And so with every linked list, you have um, you know, some head pointer, some first element in the list. This is a very low abstraction linked list. The node, all nodes are the same. There is no wrapping linked list object. Uh, so we take H, we say uh, while H next. Now you'll recall uh, we don't have to say doesn't equal null because if x is, or if h is, 
If h next is null, uh, null is zero and zero is false. So this is the same thing as writing doesn't equal fall or null, uh, except it's one less calculation you have to do. So while h equals no, or h next, uh, so while it's not null, basically, uh, we can just set h to be h next. We don't have to worry about losing the head of the list because whoever called this function still has the head. We don't need to go back to the head of the list. We just need to walk through the list until we know the next element is not null. That's how we know, or is null. That's how we know we're at the tail. And then finally, when you're done, you just return h. So in this case, we didn't use a temporary. We just used the h as the temporary. That's fine. Like I said, it's not destructive. So a few things here. Um, a couple people accidentally used dots. Uh, you know, it won't compile, but the compiler will tell you about it. Uh, we already had a question about arrows, so I didn't take off points for this because I don't want to punish you twice for the same mistake. Fun fact, uh, this code uh, basically also works in Java. Uh, if you wrote the working Java code for this um, inside of the function, it still works. It's the same algorithm. So, and it's, it's really the same methodology as how syntactically similar C and Java are. C is, Java is a C-like language. Uh, it, its history is from C. So this question really tells me a few things. Um, you know, if you understand data structures well, uh, then you won't have a problem with the future assignments because the future assignments will ask you to read a data structure that's been written and reason about it, answer questions about it, figure out how to modify it. Uh, linked list is the most basic data structure you will probably ever see. So if you're able to do this, then you are at the jumping off point to do the rest of the class. Uh, and you understand how to apply these algorithms in C, you understand how to interact with structs, uh, you understand a little bit how these pointers work, you understand that the shape of a linked list is how the pointers are structured. The next element is here and it points to the next node. Uh, that's how references work. That's how, this is how objects work. This is how pointers in C work with complex objects that have pointers inside of structs. So uh, that's really it for this one. I saw a few other interesting solutions. I saw some recursive ones. Uh, of course, if you made a mistake, you probably lost a few points, uh, but that was interesting to see. Um, I guess fun, fun aside, uh, when you do recursion, you call a function. So if your function foo is recursive, you get a stack frame every time you call the function. If you've ever received a bug in your code or a, a, an error in your Java code when you were learning recursion, uh, it probably said something like stack smashing error heap overflow uh, some other things there it really depends on what happens uh, at the time there's a few applicable errors but basically what that means is that you if you've messed up your base case and you just keep recursing forever you use up all of your stack memory on stack frames this is where stack frames come into play. Stack frames are not just a C thing. They are a, this is how programs are structured on computers thing. So if you run out the bottom of the stack, then you, you're out of memory, you're gonna crash. It doesn't matter if it's C, it doesn't matter if it's Java, it doesn't matter if it's Python, this will happen. Um, so understand this is, a, this, this is an interlanguage concept that we're trying to, to get at here. Uh, anyway, let's move on. We're almost done. Uh, number 15, what is the bug in the following code that will eventually cause it to crash? 
Uh, the bug here, uh, basically this is an infinite loop. I told you it's an infinite loop, it's intentional. There is no dangling pointer here. Dangling pointer would be if we never initialized the variable pointer. Uh, it, 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 this isn't dangling. It actually has memory assigned to it. So we assign some memory. Uh, we assign a value to that memory. We go through the loop. When we do that, we lose our reference to the previous malloc. We allocate memory and we throw it on the ground. This is a big difference from Java. This is one of the biggest differences from Java. You've maybe been told Java has, um, has garbage collection. When you, in Java, if you declare an object in Java, if you say, um, you know, x equals new car, and then your function ends, this new car goes on the heap. And you put it right here. When you walk out of scope, something called the garbage collector comes through and eats it up. And so this memory is freed again, you can get it back for later. In C, we don't have that. There is no garbage collection. It's part of what makes C fast. It's part of what gives you a lot of control in C. You call malloc. You go out of scope. Nobody is here to eat the memory that you allocated. It just, you just lose the pointer. You forget you had that memory, but it still is allocated. You do it again in the next iteration. 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 Eventually, you run out of memory. This is a memory leak, and this is a, the, maybe the simplest example of how this can cause catastrophic problems in your program, and they might take a long time to show up. Uh, this loop will never exit. This data will never be freed because the program will never end. There are lots of programs, you may not have written any, but there are lots of programs that will never end. They have infinite loops. Your video games probably have an infinite loop uh, that runs the game engine. Your, um, your web server has to stay up all the time. We don't reboot the web server. A memory leak in the web server will eventually cause the whole thing to come down. Memory leaks like this are often the cause of a lot of the major infrastructure outages you see at large companies. Uh, frequently, it is things like memory leaks. Uh, so this is important to learn conceptually because this is a huge difference from things you've seen before. We do have to manage the memory ourselves. When we're done with it, we need to free it. You free x. You free the original index of x. So it has to look like this. If we change this, if we do x++ plus plus and you call free, this will crash your program. Free doesn't know what to deal with the, this address because malloc never gave you this address. Malloc gave you an address one before this. So you need to give the original address. You don't want to lose the address that malloc gave you. You need that to free it later. Okay, one last question. Uh, this question, um, well, we've been drawing these memory diagrams most of the semester. Uh, and you have to know them. And I think I've tried to make it clear that we have to know them. Uh, in fact, this exact problem was on your quiz. Uh, at the, what, at the end of January or something like this. And also we spent the following class period doing this example and a bunch of other examples of exactly this. At this point in time, you should understand the program memory layout. If you do not understand the program memory layout, you will have trouble later in the semester. So let's go ahead and scribble this out real quick. I'll leave it up while I scribble this. So, uh, the memory layout always looks the same. You were given the reference for what the layout looks like. Uh, the details that we're interested in are the stack and the heap in this scenario. 
Uh, that's primarily lo what we're looking about. Looking at, we haven't talked about these other things as much, although you should know a function pointer probably points down here in the code segment. For this image, uh, I will just draw the heap in the stack because I wasn't expecting anything meaningful from the other components. So somewhere down here, you have the heap. I actually recommend you draw the heap later. In fact, you don't actually even need to start with the heap. Let's just assume this is the stack. Uh, and let's leave it open-ended because one way to do this is to just walk through it. So when your program executes, assume you are the computer. Start executing your program. You start at main. Main is your first stack frame. Things that go in the stack frame are variables. Uh, now, there is a little aside here about this printf. The printf uh, has some interesting things, but we're not going to talk about them. So you do x. x is our first variable. That's the first thing we see when we're processing. x, and the memory for x goes on the stack, so it's a 4. x is 4. Uh, so let's just take a peek here. So this is our stack frame so far from main uh, and x. So all we've done is execute line 11, line 12. Then we want to execute line 13. Uh, line 13 is a function call. So we end our first stack frame and we switch to a new stack frame. Stack grows down. You do foo, main, foo. Well, it doesn't have to grow down, but we, we draw it as growing, as growing down. Um, most systems have it growing down. It could grow up if you wanted to. Again, all of this is designed by humans. It's a, it's a design decision. It's not a fundamental about the way computers work. Main, okay, new stack frame for foo. So we want to look at what happens inside of foo. Foo has a variable y. y calls malloc. So y, the variable, is allocated on the stack. Y calls malloc and generates some memory, exactly enough memory for four integers, on the heap. So while we're still on this line, after we've executed that line, we have this. Our stack frame, foo, uh, has Y. Y holds a memory address. That memory address points to memory down here in the heap. Okay, and then that's it for line eight. Um, line nine calls another function. So we get a new stack frame. We get bar. We get a new stack frame because we call the new function. New function, new stack frame. We call bar. Bar has an argument. Oh, I did make a mistake. Uh-oh. Uh, we want to take a look real quick here. Don't forget you have arguments. Your argument here matters. Uh, I may have forgotten to grade that. I don't remember. But anyway, A matters. A points at X because that is what we were given. We were given the address of X. So A points at um, X all the way back in the stack frame of main. So let's take a look at what that actually looks like. A points to X, okay? It points up in the stack to X. All right, and now we do our, our stack frame for bar. So bar takes an argument Z. Z also is a pointer. So it's going to point to something. The memory address that Z points to is the argument Y. So notice it does not point to Y. We did not take the address of Y. It points to the same thing that Y does. It takes a copy of the address of Y. Z is a copy of Y. Whatever Z points to is the same thing Y points to, which is this heap memory down here. Uh, okay, then we initialize Z. 
uh, and we just give z the value of i equals 0, 1, 2, 3. So if i is 0, z 0 equals 0, z 1 equals 1, z 2 equals 2. And so we fill that in because we know what these values are. We didn't know what they were before. They were random garbage. Now they are 0, 1, 2, 3. And then I think that's where this problem asks you to stop. If we take a look at the problem, uh, we do line 5. Just before line 5 is executed, there's nothing here. Uh, so this is where this ends. So to cap this off, we would just draw this piece here, this finish this stack frame, frame zero, frame one, frame two, and you're done. Um, this is the answer. If you put something that looks a lot like this, then I gave you probably full credit. Uh, if you made some small mistakes, you probably lost a few points. I was pretty lenient on this because I was a little surprised at how um, distant the answers are from what we got. Uh, of course, several, several, several students wrote the right thing. Uh, but the answer, there was not a lot of gray area. Uh, the answers were either really right or really wrong. So if they were really wrong, I did try to give you credit if it looked like you had the right ideas. Uh, but... Uh, I can only grade what I understand. If I couldn't find an interpretation for your drawing that made a lot of sense, then you probably didn't make a lot of points, unfortunately. So this is something you want to study and look into. It is something that you can find plenty of resources about. Um, and of course, we've talked about it uh, in class many times. Um, We've shown examples like this. Uh, you can walk through GDB if you walk through GDB. We did this in class um, for about 30 minutes one day. We walked through this exact program uh, and printed this stuff out as the program was executing. This is a real thing. It's a conceptual diagram, but it is a real thing. Uh, and so you can Google memory layout of programs and you will find lots of resources like this. Um, but we spent so much time in class on that that I'm not quite sure what else to advise you to look at. So if you're still struggling with this, um, I, I, I don't have a lot of good ideas except to come and talk with me uh, or your TA about this concept because it is very important. It is global. It doesn't just apply to C programs. It broadly applies to any program that you look at. Uh, any language, any computer system generally looks like this in one way or another. Uh, so it is important to understand if you're struggling, I advise you to come talk to me or study this example. Um, but we've done this many times. So um, there is a small group that I think didn't know what to write here because they haven't been coming to class. But like I said, we've done this pretty much every other, probably about 50% of the days this semester. So if you aren't attending enough, that you've, if you're attending so little you've never seen this, you really need to come to class more often. That's really the best advice I can give you, unfortunately, uh, because it is important. You can study this online. It's just that we've done this so many times, I do think that it, it may be we need to, you need to talk with us more about what's going on. Uh, anyway, uh, that's plenty of time for this video, so we'll, we'll wrap up here. Uh, thank you for watching. Let me know if you have any questions. Let me know if this was helpful. Let me know if this wasn't helpful. Um, yeah, otherwise, see you in class.